And suppose you think that I'm here to actually knock this thing down, but this is not the case, you know. Uh, we're here actually to restore it, and we've, we've fitted round it 16 new iron bands to help preserve our industrial heritage. Fred was best known for felling chimneys, but that was the job he liked least. His real interest was in restoring them and keeping them standing. And it was this work and the places it took him to that had the biggest influence on him. I think Fred, when he had to knock down a chimney, was very upset because, of course, he started off as a young man, as a, a very young boy, watching the steeplejacks climbing the big chimneys and repairing them and when it came full circle and time to demolish them it was very sad I know he confided in me many many occasions where we would get the old photographs out and look and he'd study them and think I well that's no longer there I remember a time on the Bolton skyline when you could see dozens and dozens of these big things and it was a great great sadness in Fred that he had to demolish so many chimneys really I think in, in his job as uh, a steeplejack in uh, moving around all these uh, factories and so on, he would see the beauty of Victorian work. Uh, first of all, the chimneys themselves, the brickwork on those was, uh, you know, outstanding. And uh, he would note that first of all, and no doubt, since chimneys are attached to boiler houses, he would walk around the associated boiler houses and uh, look at the workmanship in there. And uh, I suppose he'd start with the brickwork which wasn't just ordinary kind of house brick work, it was very good brick work and had a very good finish on it and was, was quite artistic. Fred lived through an age in which we started off by knocking down uh, a large part of the Victorian heritage and then grew to value it. And he was obviously engaged on both sides of the argument because he was involved with, with knocking down the great chimneys of the, of the mills. At the same time, he was involved with lovingly restoring steam machinery, bringing it to a wider public. One of the restoration projects that he took on was here at Weatherick's Country Pottery in Cumbria. This weird and wonderful creation behind me is what's known as a blunger. And about five years ago, you know, I, I came here to look at the steam engine and the boiler, and this creation were like had willow herbs growing out at top of it, and it were in great danger of disappearing into the ground forever and we got the job of restoring it and more or less it's practically a brand new one you know there's only the, the gearing and the burrings and the some of the ironwork is, is original across the other side of the road there were a big clay pit and they dug the clay out of the pit and brought it up the hill on a, on a railway and tipped it into this ginormous Kenwood Chef cake mixer and added water and the water and the machinery mixed, mixed all the clay up and all the pebbles fell to the bottom and then when it became the consistency of her own milk chocolate they flooded it off down a trough that, and into a lagoon over there and then they pumped the water off the top back to another pond which is situated to the side of the site and when it had set nice and hard they cut it out in blocks and made the pots out of it uh, and like we've, we've now restored it to working order and of course it's driven by the steam engine which is in this engine house over here. This is Josephine, you know, this is the engine that drives the plunger outside and um, it took me and my assistant about six months or seven months to restore it, you know, we pulled the thing to bit and carted it back to Bolton and restored it all and brought it back here and here it is now, driving all the machinery in the pocket. This passion for preserving the past came over in everything that Fred did. I think Fred was very important in making us aware of the heritage around us, not just in the great town halls and the great railway stations, but actually in the small-scale domestic 
architecture and artefacts. Um, I mean, I think about the, the sort of things that he was um, collecting himself. Pieces of shop fronts which were going to decay and had been painted over and nobody took any care of anymore. And he rescued them and showed us that these things are all around us. Little engines that would end up on a scrap heap but were part of our industrial heritage. All of these engines were lovingly restored by Fred, but the restoration projects he is best remembered for are his steamroller and his traction engine. After 27 years and two divorces, and a lot of hard graft, we've only got 100 pound on, but we're going to give it a go and see what happens. I know it'll go round, but it's what it'll sound like is the important thing. So this is it, here we go. Handle forward, regulator open, nothing happened, wait a minute. Ah. We're going backwards at that, we'll try it forwards. Magic. <laughs> All them years and never knowing really whether we were ever going to make it or not. Uh, when do you think we nearly made a new one? Uh, and all. We have made a new one. <laughs> yeah, yeah. A lot of people that uh, he was with at the steam rallies, etc. Of course, they all they're all just the same. They're all people that are born out of their time because they all wish to preserve the things that they do. And it's not so important the fact that, uh, you know, why they've saved something, it's just it's important the fact that they have. Aha! Good Lord! <laughs> Who gave you a passport to come here? How are you? A long time no see, Fred. It is indeed. Absolutely. Good to see you. I'm well and you. And it was thanks to Fred that the efforts of enthusiasts like this were brought to our attention. Here in this building, there's a dedicated bunch of ladies and gentlemen who have been restoring mill engines for the last 40, well, 30 odd years. And I think I'll nip inside and see how they're doing. Hello, Hello friend. <laughs> Fancy meeting you. Ah, well, I know I get about a bit, you know. The last time I saw this, it were in a million pieces. You're doing quite well now, with well, it. It's, I haven't uh, counted them, but it seems like a million at yeah, times. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's uh, looking pretty good, isn't mm -hmm. it? it Almost ready for once you put all the bits and various rods on. Yep, it's it nearly finished. Be, uh, it should be able to light a fire underneath it. It's been on the shop floor for the last 30 years, about. Yeah. But uh, we've been working on it mm. at this level now for about uh, two years. Yeah, yeah. It doesn't, and, uh, it doesn't seem to be very far off, it looks we're, like. We're getting near the end. Yeah, all, all looks, the hard work's been done, hasn't it? It has, uh, it certainly has. And where is this beam? Well, that's a rough guess. About seven tonnes, I should think. Yeah, yeah, it's a fair piece of iron, yeah. isn't it? That's what I call a real work of art, that, Fred. There's more went into the skill yeah. of making this than Picasso ever put into one of the expensive paintings. Oh, yeah, that's a fact, yeah. That's my humble opinion. Well, you were drunk half the time, weren't you? Yeah, well, I suppose <laughs> some of the blokes that put this up were drunk half the time. More than likely, yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm looking forward to seeing it running, to be quite honest. Yeah, I bet you. Yeah. I didn't think I'd have lived to see that, but mm. no, looks like I'm going to do it. He was in at a time when the sort of first generation of industry and old machinery enthusiasts were about, when people were just beginning to get the idea of rescuing traction engines from scrapyards and, uh, and, and sort of raising historic boats and repairing them. Yeah. I couldn't really think of a nicer place to restore a paddle boat on than here on the bonny banks of Loch Lomond. I think I'll go and have a chat with the lads who are doing it. They've got a lot of a big hard task in front of them. He was in right at the beginning of that. And um, I think that and those wide-eyed loonies <laughs> will have uh, influenced him, because he's one of them. Ding, ding. <laughs> <laughs> You've got your work cut out there, haven't you, mate? Yeah. Yes, 
that did yeah. work here. I see you've done the other one on the other side. Yes, that took a few yeah. days. Yeah, I bet it mm. did, no, yeah. I know I've got one of them, and progress mm. is very slow, very but slow. when you've done it, you know, it gets all, it's amazing what thickness of corrosion it bangs mm. loose, isn't it? Well, yeah. they've been putting layers of paint on since yeah, 1953, yeah. probably. Yeah. And just when, flicking a yes, bit off when yeah. they did it, yeah. Really wasting paint doing it that way, isn't it? It, it is, you know, yes. You're better yeah. off getting it yeah. down to the bottom. How long have you had it like? How sort of, you know? Well, we came along about five years ago and it was a very sorry state indeed. Yeah, I can imagine. Yeah, she was yeah. very derelict and rusty. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And had been lying for a number of years in that yeah. state. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. We've, we've been coming down every Saturday for the last mm. five years. And mm. Going, how many you know, how many of a team have you got? It varies from five yeah. to twelve. Yeah, on, fifteen on en, maybe. On enthusiasm on yeah. the day. Mm. On a good day. Yeah. Fred's programmes have helped everybody to understand exactly uh, what preserving the heritage is all about and why it's so important to us. And it wasn't just ships and engines and big machines that he wanted to see preserved. He champions uh, more ordinary buildings. We all know about great palaces and cathedrals and so on. But Fred talks about ordinary industrial buildings as well and where people lived and where people worked. And that's just as important part of our social history. One of the great things that Fred did for us was to show us the variety of places in Britain that need to be preserved for future generations. And there's one way in which we can all get involved, and he shows how volunteers, just members of the public, maybe with special skills, or maybe people who are just enthusiastic, can get involved. Somewhere like Cold Harbour Mill, which is full of volunteers who are all hugely involved in preserving and maintaining that place so that we can all enjoy it. And then John, <laughs> you want me to dig too hard? <laughs> <laughs> it's a bit moth-eaten, isn't it? You know. It's a bit. I've had the money's yeah. worth out of this one. Yeah, yeah, they have. Oh, yeah. It must have been a bit on the tight side with all these patches. How long do you think it will be before you've got the... Uh, the well, it's about a two-year project. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You, you've got somebody to give you some nice sheets of tin. Have you? For the oh, yeah. The local engineering firm yeah. have been very good to us. Yeah, well, that's all right. Shall we go and have a look at your beam engine? What a good idea. Yeah, come on. This is it, is it then? This is the thing that uh, replaced the water wheel. It certainly yeah. did. Yes, in the mid 19th century, yeah. uh, they brought in steam power. This is where the first beam mm. engine sat and uh, was more reliable, of course, than water power. Yeah, yeah, especially when they'd had an hot summer and there were no water in the pond. Yeah, it's, it's an interesting engine, this, isn't it? There's a lot of unusual bits and bobs about it. I mean, this linkage from here to the, the stop valve, you know, I mean, it, it's magnificent, isn't it? Like, mm. yeah, who needs a gym when you've got them sort of things? Well, there you go, it's all heavy stuff, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. Yes, it takes well, us uh, a day to warm up. Yeah. Warm the boiler with, up, with the before boiler, a steamer. Yeah. Mm. And, because, uh, of course, we've got two big engines to run yeah, as well. Yeah. So, uh, let's go right, and have a look at the other big engine. more modern, isn't it? Mm. Uh, more the That's uh, turn right. of the century, job. That's right. When yeah, the beam was. engine was scrapped here, yeah. the other engine was fitted. Yeah, yeah. Well, go and have a look at the other one. Good idea. Yeah, go and have a look. <laughs> No, but I've been inside of Fred had a particular interest in the preservation of our industrial heritage, but in his programmes he looked at much wider conservation issues. Mm, bath time. <laughs> Fred's big contribution in terms of issues and standards and values um, with conservation is he's highlighted technology. There's a tendency for people to highlight the appearance of things rather than the uh, way that things are put together and what they're made of and how they work. And I think Fred's way of looking at a medieval structure is a very refreshing way of doing it. This is the church of the Hospital of St Cross and building started in 1135 and this is the only major bit that survived. When it was first built it had a thatch roof but sometime in the 14th century, it acquired the lead one. Now, around the other side, they're actually taking part of it off, so we'll be able to go and see how the Normans put a roof on a church like this one. He's looking at it saying, how did they put these particular um, 
timbers together? What order was it done in? Um, how are the loads transmitted? All, all of that sort of thing. How do they get those pegs in there? You know, how are they going to maintain this thing? A practical view. Um, and we don't often hear that about old things. We, we hear about sort of flowerings of the human spirit on a grand scale. But we don't very often hear the detail of how it's made and mm -hmm. of how it's maintained. And I think that sort of practicality really strikes a chord with a lot of people and is one of the reasons why he was such a great man. Hey. Morning, Fred. <laughs> Hello, Stuart. I've come out when I've seen what you're doing in your tent up here. <laughs> to have a look how the Normans built big, thick walls. Or not so thick. Yeah, yes. yeah, well, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. It's a bit... Uh, what were down the middle there, like? Uh, well, when we started work here, this was concrete. Uh, yeah. Concrete was put in by the Victorians. Oh, yeah. uh, it originally had a wooden gutter all the way through here, mm. clad in lead. Yeah. Um, and when that rotted away with age, the Victorians had just discovered concrete mm. and decided to, uh, to pour the whole gutter in concrete mm. and then cover it in lead. Mm. But what happened was the, uh, the concrete acted like a wick. Where yeah. it touched the wall, it mm. drew all the moisture in. Mm. That travelled right through the concrete. Yeah. And you can see what it's done here. Yeah. Um, it's it's yeah, eaten oh. the wood away. Oh. The uh, Death Watch beetle have made a meal of it. They like mm. soft timber, and that's yeah. what they've chosen to eat first. Yeah, you can see how it's kicking over, isn't it? Absolutely, yes. Yeah. Yeah. The spread of the yeah. roof is slowly rolling this, and these yeah. joints at one time would have been tight. Mm. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> have you seen any of these deadly... Death Watch Yes, people. we have, yes. We had a grub yesterday. Yeah. Um, but we decided it had already done its enough damage and uh, yeah. I'm afraid I squashed it. Fred was a very good communicator and very good at explaining how buildings worked and how they actually stood up in the first place. And of course, if buildings can't stand up, there's no point in having them. Um, and if people can understand how buildings were put together in the past, it can be a guide to how they can be repaired in the future and also help people really appreciate what's going on with their buildings. See, you've got a dustbin full of uh, yes. building materials. Yes. This is our flints. I mean, the yeah. great thing about this is that they're the originals. Yeah, they're quite heavy um, stuff, isn't it? Yes, um, all the weight in that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we'll, we'll lose a percentage here, oh, yeah, but we can replace yeah. them off the fields. Yeah, again, yeah, just the way yeah. they did just in the first place. Just uh, out with a bucket. Absolutely. <laughs> Tied right. on your back. Ah, uh, yes. Times yeah. have changed. Mm. Farmers yeah. used to be glad for us to take them. Yeah. They want money for it. They're all hard up, aren't they? The outside of the vaulting looks a bit rough, but of course inside it's lovely. Oh it? yes, yeah. yes. I yeah. mean this line here that you can see, mm. these mm. stones, mm. They, you can actually see those mm. inside. And you'll see that really sort of shows us how thick the vaulting is. Mm. Because inside you'll see that this mm. is right at the top of the piece you can see. Yeah, so it's and like so this is all yeah, about on top of 14 it. or 15 inches thick. Yeah. Yes, I mean yeah. the vaulting is basically an arch, mm. and an arch only works if it's got a weight on it. Oh, so yeah, all yeah. this has just been put on top yeah, to add strength it together. It. Yeah, yes. yeah. And yeah, it's I mean, been... Really, when you think they had no cement mixers, there must have been armies of blocks yeah. mixing the mortar yeah. to keep the wall. I mean, we're we're, uh, we're 50, 60 feet up here, so mm. all that's been carried up here. Yeah. Um, tons and yeah, tons of it, yeah. with no idea what the actual yeah, weight is. Sand and lime, eh? Yes. As soon as you show the general public a really skilled craftsman doing what they do, um, most people are immediately fascinated and engaged by it. And, you know, naturally unrespectful of it. You know, great craft skill, and there are sadly few of them in a lot of craft areas. So I thought it was terrific that, that Fred actually first wanted to get his hands dirty himself, partly to show, in a way which conveys how difficult this is, um, and also to, to celebrate the, the skills of people like you know, stonemasons, tile makers, um, of, uh, of plasterers. I mean, those are extraordinary levels of skill, which today have largely been short circuited by industrial manufacture of building materials, um, by the use of plasterboard instead. Um, and those, a lot of those skills are barely kept alive, um, and it, it needs. It needs publicity to remind people that they're there um, and, to, and to pay tribute to them, not least because we, we really need them to keep our historic buildings standing. He was very good at 
seeing what was going on. He very often dealt with topical things uh, like the conservation at Item Moat, for example, actually looking at the way uh, the walls had been constructed originally and how trouble was being taken to do them in the original way, so that it was genuine conservation. And so often he would take an example. He'd always want to have a go himself, which was very important. Right, mm. this is where we mix, Fred. Mm -hmm. As you can see, oh, yeah, I've, I've the, already got the, the nice modern machine, and the, right? Yeah, and the <laughs> shovel, which you're, if you put and these gloves on, I'll you show you. want me to go in the gomok. That's right. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> All right. Mm. That's surgical, That's these, right. aren't they? Yeah. Mm. No, it's what, approximately right. half and of that half full of... of, full yeah. of um, that is the sifted cow dung. Yeah, it's, it's Fresh nice cow stuff, dung. is it? That's it. Yeah, wait a minute. Uh, you got it. Yeah. That's it. Mmm. Yeah. And it, you can tell. Uh, yeah. Nice measure. Yeah. Mm. Ooh, you are rich, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> I was collecting this seven o'clock this morning. Yeah, so it's fresh. Our local, yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. Dairy yeah, herd. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. I've never been into rubber gloves here. <laughs> How do you get that one off? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Paul. Yeah, you're going to enjoy your toast. And... <laughs> oh, it's all right. I'm used to pretty rough things, you know. Yeah. I'll tell you what, it takes a bit of mixing, doesn't it? Yeah, it's not, it, it, uh, it's, it's... it isn't sort of easy to shove about. Just turn it over, that's it. You've got it. Yeah. It's changing colour slowly. Looking good, eh? I think you're almost there. Yeah. yeah, yeah. What's the idea of the uh, the codon like? Right. Well, it, it does give it more uh, elasticity, you know, with yeah, the, uh, yeah, yeah. when you're spreading it. It also hardens. Yeah. Acts as a hard. Who first invented it? <laughs> yeah, well, uh, obviously before the lime and that, it was a uh, wattle, and that was yeah. cow <laughs> yeah. and, and and horse straw and dung, wasn't it? So yeah. they've used it for, but it's it's an adhesion as well, you know. It, it's <laughs> the type of cow mutton, does it? That's right. <laughs> I would say he's done that before myself. Oh, I've mixed a bit of mortar in the chat. Have you? Yeah. <laughs> Never with any comuck in it. <laughs> See how you get on with that. <laughs> I'll have a go. Have a go. <laughs> right. Do you want me to continue in a downward yeah, direction? Yeah, that'd be nice. Uh, uh, uh. <laughs> oh, bloody hell. <laughs> Let me put less on the hook, perhaps. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's it. Push it well in, because it has to go through the, yeah. the larve to key. Yeah. Yeah, wait a minute. That, that's all right, come on. He could turn his on to anything. Anything. You mentioned it and he'd, he'd, he'd do a very good job, no matter what it was. Now that's going to be there 800 years. Yeah. It's good to think that we do something that's going to stand up mm. the test of time, doesn't it, really? Yeah, I think Any, that's enough for me. That's great. Any time you want a job with me. <laughs> yeah, it does have a tendency to stick to the floor, doesn't it? Yeah. I mean that. So yeah. when you think how well it sticks to the floor, it must stick to the the like the proverbial what's it to the blanket. Well, and that's it? right. A lot well, of people well. who look it's at half timbered houses don't really know they're all this goes on. It's um, yeah. quite a job really. At least it's going back as it was mm. and uh, mm. Mm. that's a good thing I think. Yeah. It's uh, yeah. It'll be lovely when it's done, won't it? And Fred had plenty of experience at restoring an old building. When I bought this house about 40 years ago, it basically were a two up and two down. And of course as my family got bigger I, I got to do something about it so I like built as much on it again, you know. Um, you know all the wonderful buildings we've been looking at, you know, even castles and all that. They, they've all been messed about with an extended one way and another, you know. Even kings were great DIY men. There've been extensions done to the house in the days of the Earl of Bradford, but they didn't make a very good job of it, you know. They, they completely omitted all the beading and the fancy work. 
but when I did mine, you know, I thought I'll try and reproduce what they did in 1854. When I first did the, the moulding uh, and the fancy bits, the, the little square pieces were, were sort of very white material, you know, and they, they, were, they stood out like a sore thumb. So I made a, a mixture of mud and water out of the back garden and painted them and of course God and the rain has done the rest. They're now quite a, you know, quite a good match for the, with the moulding. But Fred's way of restoring things and making the new work blend in with the old doesn't fit in with current conservation policy, as he found out in Edinburgh. This magnificent monument here on Princess Street in Edinburgh was erected in remembrance of Sir Walter Scott, the famous Scottish writer. Recently, there's been quite a lot of restoration work done on it, and uh, they've used exactly the same stone, but of course, it'll never get as black as what the rest of it is, because there won't be the same amount of smoke in Edinburgh as there used to be. Uh, the thing is that I rather think that if I did on it, I'd have daubed a bit of mud on it, you know, make it blend in with the other. But apparently the powers that be say it's because the future generations will be able to see where the late 20th century repairs were naturally done to it, you see, in, in the future years to come. Well, that's the official policy, but Fred's way would be more likely to win the popular vote. When you're talking about saving Britain's heritage and bring it to people's attention. I don't think anybody did as much as Fred in popularising it, bringing it down to a level where everybody could understand it and wanted to get involved. And he brought to our attention examples of preservation work in some of the most surprising places, like here in the Lloyds Building in London. I thought I might show you something a little bit different. Mm. So if you'd like to come in here, Wow. <laughs> well, this thread is, uh, is something of a contrast. This is, um, this, is a genuine, <laughs> this is a genuine Robert Adam dining room. Mm -hmm. um, the reason it's here is that when we had virtually completed the 1958 building, which mm -hmm. is on the other side of Lime Street, we found that part of Bowood House in Wiltshire, which belonged to the Marquis of Lansdowne, was being demolished. Mm. And this room was due to be destroyed. Um, so Lloyd's collectively um, purchased the room. We also mm -hmm. found that happily the original firm responsible for creating the room under still Adam's existed. direction was mm. still in existence. So we commissioned them again mm -hmm. and the whole room was cut into sections, brought to the city and recreated in the 1958 mm. building. Well, of course, if you've done that once, mm. there's you no reason again. why you can't do it again. Mm. That's right. So when we moved from 58 to 86, and the room came with us. And the great thing about the room as you see it now is that it's actually gone back to its original proportions. In the mm. 1958 building, because of a height restriction, it had a flat ceiling. Mm -hmm. But here, um, yeah, if, that, if Robert Adam walked through yeah. the room, uh, we like to think yeah, that he would, he, he would recognise it. One of the things I liked about Fred's programmes were the moments when he'd suddenly say, I've got one of those at home. And you'd think, how amazing. But of course he had, and quite, um, in some ways quite ordinary things. What he had, he had a bit of wood carving off the front of a house and he'd restored it and he'd done it up and he would talk about it and stroke it and make you look at it uh, more carefully. And he was very good at making you see the special in very ordinary things. Believe it or not, you know, I've been looking around while we've been talking and that Cornish moulding up there, across the end of my back kitchen, I've got a piece almost exactly the same. <laughs> I didn't know Robert Adam was a kitchen designer. Well, so. no, I know he had nothing to do with it. You, know, <laughs> you can buy anything nowadays in shops. <laughs>